Father, thank you once again for this wonderful privilege to gather together as family in the unity of the faith. Thank you for the simple things of getting us up out of bed this morning so that we can make it here, enjoy each other's company, be encouraged by each other's faith. Let us encourage each other as long as it's called today, Father, this way and so many other ways. Thank you for the privilege of doing so. Father, we pray for those that are struggling, those that are ill, uh, those that, are, that want to be here this morning but cannot be for legitimate reasons. Our hearts go out to them, and we just pray that this message reach their hearts at some way and some time uh, in the future, if not now. Father, we pray especially for those that are still completely lost. We realize the great commission on our lives. We understand the magnitude of it as well as the privilege of performing it. We just pray, Father, that divine opportunity be beheld by each of us uh, when it arises so that we might evangelize those that are lost. And we pray also for the perseverance and the tenacity and the love for doing so. We are most grateful and thankful, of course, for love that hung on the cross to cancel out that debt, to make even a morning like this a reality for all of us. May we never become familiar with it. We do just ask for your blessings on this morning's message. May it be edifying for our souls. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. Again, this morning's message title is American Dating is a Counterfeit, Part 2. Uh, if you didn't catch Part 1, it was Thursday. Uh, you certainly should be keeping up um, with these lessons. Uh, this morning's lesson won't make as much sense as it should if you didn't and you haven't been keeping up. Um, but nonetheless, that's between you and the Lord. Go to Ecclesiastes 11.9. We're going to get some general guidance. We're going to start similarly the way we did on Thursday evening on this topic. I believe personally this topic is an uh, enormous topic. It's not, a, it's not a small topic at all. It may sound like, oh, dating, you know, it's one thing we do in life. I would say that American dating is a huge problem. And then uh, we, in our tremendous marketing abilities as Americans, as a society, we spread this disease to other parts of the world. Ecclesiastes 11.9. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes 11, verse 9. Rejoice, young man, during your childhood, and let your heart be pleasant during the days of young manhood, and follow the impulses of your heart and the desires of your eyes. Yet, know that God will bring you to judgment for all these things. In other words, there are going to be certain things that are appealing to us, especially young, in our younger lives. Uh, the, Paul goes on to speak about youthful lusts, as we've been studying as of late. But really, Solomon's wisdom is saying that uh, you have to understand consequences up here on the board. It's true. We can make whatever decisions we desire in life. God gave us free will. However, since no thought or deed goes unnoticed by him, everything we ever do will be judged. Now, I'm not talking about um, the judgment on the cross. I'm talking about him realizing and judging deeds and activities. So again, it's true. We can make whatever decisions we desire in life. God gave us free will. However, since no thought or deed goes unnoticed by him, everything we ever do will be judged. Ecclesiastes 11.9, Matthew 5.16, 1 Corinthians 3. 11 through 15, 4, 3 to 5, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, Revelation 22, 12, and that's just a sampling. 
I think where spiritually mature principles come up is when people begin making lifestyle choices. And we're going to talk about that this morning. Lifestyle choices. People that knowingly make choices that uh, steer their own lives. Not, you know, a spur of the moment, oh, I had a sinful thought or a thing here or a thing there. We're talking about lifestyle choices, which American dating really is. It's a way of life. It's, you know, from, from a very early age. I mean, some kids as early as, believe it or not, elementary school start thinking about you know, having girlfriends and boyfriends and these kinds of things and it just degrades from there, at least in America. So there are maturity principles that come up when we begin talking about lifestyle issues and choices. And sadly, uh, many of these choices are contrary to God's will. I think this is not only disobedient, which is where most immature people end their thinking. They would say, oh, well, God doesn't want me to do it, but whatever. I know I shouldn't be doing this, but whatever. That's where an immature person's thinking stops. But in some ways, even more critically, these lifestyle choices hurt people. They hurt people, both themselves and others. And that's the real problem, because that's not the heart of Christ. So these lifestyle choices hurt people, both themselves and others. So let's keep this in mind as we continue with Scripture. Again, understanding consequences is true. We can make whatever decisions we desire in life. God gave us a free will. However, since no thought or deed goes unnoticed by Him, everything we ever do will be judged. Go to Matthew 5.16. This is a good place to start. Matthew 5.16, speaking of your lifestyle, and do not forget that it's probably true that most people in your life know what you say you are. Most of you say that you're a Christian, right? That you're a believer in Christ. And most of the people that run into you in your lives are going to know that. Is that fair to say? I hope so. Okay, so what does Scripture say? Matthew 5, 16. Let your light shine. Don't just say, oh, I'm a Christian. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. How about that? Let your light shine before men, and that means in front of others. And we all have a wake in this world. We all go to work, we go home, we have associates, we have friendships, um, let your light shine before men. If you say you're a Christian, then represent Christ because you are an ambassador. Let your light shine before men in such a way that may, they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Go to Romans 12.1. Romans 12.1. Romans 12.1, you notice it doesn't say just let your, your light shine on Sunday mornings in church or anytime you step through those doors, all of a sudden a big bright light comes on. It says in front of men, that's saying in front of the rest of the world. Romans 12.1, therefore I urge you brethren by the mercies of God to present your body as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may, you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Do not be transformed by, or do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, and that is a big deal, my friends. You have to understand, what is God's will? He did give you a free will, but ultimately He wants you to orient to His. That's what it means to be sanctified, to be set apart, made holy 
for his purposes. I've taught you this in, ad nauseum in the past. That's what sanctification is, where our wills begin to coalesce, if you would, come together. That's what he wants. That's his will, so that you may prove what the will of God is. So don't be conformed to this world. Go to 1 Corinthians 3.11. 1 Corinthians 3.11. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11. We're just covering the scripture that is in that principle on the board. 1 Corinthians 3.11. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. And that's a reference to the, what we would call the judgment seat or the bema seat of Christ, and that's for believers. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. So now we start seeing that God has regard for good works versus bad, even for believers. Like I said in the principle, nothing goes unnoticed from God. Every thought, deed, action will be judged, evaluated. If any man's work which has, he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So we're not talking about losing our salvation. That was that little um, concept I gave you earlier. We're not talking about salvation issues here. We're talking about our thoughts, actions, deeds being judged even in time as part of our sanctification. If you don't think he judges you in time, why do you think you would get disciplined in time? In other words, even our heavenly rewards are based on our decisions on earth. Go to 2 Corinthians 5.10. 2 Corinthians 5.10, where we see another verse from Paul speaking directly to believers. 2 Corinthians 5.10. Second Corinthians 5.10, For we believers must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Again, we believers must, appear, uh, must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to to what he has done, whether good or bad. So again, the principle is that nothing we ever do or say or think goes unnoticed by God. And while the cross of Jesus has covered our sins in a positional sense, when it comes to sanctification, we must understand judgment and its ramifications remain. Anybody here ever been disciplined by God? Anyone ever been blessed by God? Those are judgments in time. There's this weird hyper-grace activity in the Christian church as well that says, well, since the cross covered all sins and there's no condemnation in Christ, let's take some things out of context, why don't we, while we're at it. Then we can just live like hell without any ramifications whatsoever. God sees it all, but God doesn't see it all because I'm going to take that out of out of context as well. As far as the east is from the west, God has taken his transgression from me, so therefore there's no, there's no nothing. That's a gross misappropriation of Scripture. Don't mix positional and progressive or experiential things, my friends. That's what the hyper-grace people do. And they get a lot of people thinking really awful things and living in licentiousness. License to sin, get it? So we do have a free will, however God sees everything, and everything is judged at some point. So, why would the Spirit spend the first several minutes of a sermon titled, American Dating is a Counterfeit on Understanding Consequences? I mean, we just spent, you know, the first ten minutes or so of class on a 
message titled American Dating is a Counterfeit, but we just spent some time on understanding consequences. Why? Well, if it's not obvious, it's because he doesn't want any of you thinking this is some kind of hammer coming down on your current or past life. This is about growing up. This is about what? Growing up. And there's some of you listening to my voice right now that need to do a lot of growing up. We all still need to grow up, but on this particular topic, this is about growing up. Stop, stopping being selfish, halting things that produce sin and pain in the lives of self and others. That's what this is about. That's why we need to understand consequences. Because every decision has a consequence. In other words, the understanding consequences portion of this message is a reminder that we can cause real damage to ourselves and others in this life. And unless you're completely selfish and prepared to dismiss lots and lots of holy scripture, then you ought to listen up to the rest of this message so, back to where we started with Ecclesiastes 11.9, Solomon's wise advice. Yet know that God will bring you to judgment for all these things. In other words, everything has a consequence. Solomon's note of caution up here on the board, the gift of satisfaction. In other words, choose wisely. Choose wisely. The gift of satisfaction. True satisfaction is a gift from God. If we charge through life with sinful abandon, we, we risk ruin. There are many things to enjoy, but they must be enjoyed, you ready for this? In faith and obedience. The things we enjoy, there's so many things to enjoy, but they have to be enjoyed in faith and obedience. And I've taught you this in the past, that not everybody has access to the same blessings. News alert. Some of us are given some things before other, other people. Some of us are given some things that other people never get, and then vice versa. God has a plan. You understand? And when it comes to American dating, what Satan does is said, he basically says, and I'm going to be crass, but screw God. I'll give you what you want right now. To hell with God. I'll give you what you want right now. That's what Satan wants you to believe. Throw out faith. Throw out obedience. Throw out regard for others who might be weaker than you. I'll give you what you want right now. To heck with consequences. To heck with how it ends up in the end. So those are the overarching principles we need to keep in mind as we finish up this short series on American dating as a counterfeit. Let's begin with a simple principle up here on the board. <clears throat> the Bible on sexual sins, sex, and even sexual thoughts are grace gifts from God if and only if they are between a husband and a wife. They certainly are. Grace gifts. We call that passion. The Bible calls it out as passion in the Bible. But there's this little, this little brother, this little sinful thing called lust that exists in the Bible that speaks about when that's not the case. When it's towards someone else's spouse or someone else in general that you might not be married, you're not married to. So sex and even sexual thoughts are grace gifts from God if and only if they are between a husband and wife. Otherwise, they are fleshly. And just as a disclaimer, again, do not confuse temptation with sins of the flesh. If you're not married, then anything that produces impure and or immoral thoughts or actions ought to be hacked out of your life. Bless you. If you're not married, then anything that produces impure and or immoral thoughts or actions ought to be hacked out of your life. 
That might be a person. I'm serious. That might be a, a relationship for some of you who are so-called American dating style. What do you think the Bible's saying? What do you think the Spirit's saying? This is not Pastor Ed, so don't look at Pastor Ed. I've already given you a, enough ample scripture. But we're going to keep going on this. But if you're not married, anything that produces these immoral type things ought to be hacked out of your life. And I mean now. If you're confused about any of this, the easiest litmus test to take is a very practical one. Look. Ask yourself, is God glorified when? You defile the holy temple that is your body. You are an emotional basket case because of sexual sins. Is God glorified when godly love is supplanted by some worldly counterfeit? Consider the following principle. 1 Corinthians 10.31b Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Whatever you do. Whatever you do. Not in class, not when you come through and your light shines bright in here. Whatever you do. Do all to the glory of God. And so unless you can actually say, hey, this is bringing glory to God right now, then you need to stop. Any questions, still, let me help you out. Do all to the glory of God. This means everything. What is it? Oh, that was pathetic. What was it? Everything. Thank you. Was that, all right, single people, what was it? Everything. Thank you. How come I only heard Leo? I'm so, I'm so tired. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm applauding you. Thank you. This means everything, not just certain parts that give you the ability to point and say, you know, like the game we play, see, I do this or that to the glory of God. You know, I helped the old lady out or I, you know, paid my mother's bill or I did this thing, or I did some good thing. You see, I do good things, so stop picking on me. I'm not picking on you. If you're getting picked on, it's by the God, the Holy Spirit, the same one who inspired scripture that I'm giving you. So don't play that game. Holy Scripture says, do all. That is the objective and therefore the godly mindset. This little mini-series began with, go to 2 Timothy 2.22. 2 Timothy 2.22. You know, I think of a world, just imagine while you're turning. Imagine a world while pe where people weren't all screwed up because of dating. I'm serious. Just stop for a second. And imagine a world where people weren't all screwed up and emotionally distraught and all in this dysfunction junction where it's a cyclical up and down and up and down. Oh, we broke up the love of my love. Oh, wait a minute. Wait, oh, he's back. Oh, he's back. We're having sex. We're, we're making out. We're doing all this kind of stuff that brings zero glory to God. Imagine a world where all that was gone. Think of the purity of a, a world, just for a moment even, where all of that garbage was gone, where everybody had pure thoughts, where the only passion that existed, the only sexuality that existed was between husband and wife. Just imagine the, that right now. It's almost silly. I mean, it's completely orthogonal to American society. It's ridiculous. But just imagine that, and now you'll start understanding God's design for the sexes. He didn't design this thing called American dating. That's a counterfeit. 2 Timothy 2.22, Now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Up here on the board, this is what got us started. I wrote a blog on it, and then it just sort of snowballed. God tells us to abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Romans 12, 9, part B. He's telling us to run away from youthful lusts. For example, impure sexual thoughts. Remember, sins begin as thoughts. Avoid impurity is the gist, and do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. In other words, 
If what you're thinking, saying, or doing doesn't bring glory to God, then stop it. And please do yourself a favor. And the other person who you might be screwing up for some period or, or literally hacking scars into their soul. Some of the people you're hacking scars into might need Jesus Christ. How about that? And you're not going to evangelize them by doing what you're doing. So stop playing these ridiculous, stupid games. Whatever you're thinking, saying, or doing, if it doesn't bring glory to God, then just stop it. Oh, but you don't understand. I don't really want to understand. I want to understand what the Bible says. And the Bible says, cut it out. And if you think I'm being harsh, we'll get to that. We saw the same Greek word used by Paul in another book, but describing the same fundamental issue of sexual sin. Go to 1 Corinthians 6.18. 1 Corinthians 6.18. You see, the Bible's not shy at all on this sin. On this kind of sinning. It leads so many people astray. 1 Corinthians 6.18. Same Greek word, flee. It says flee immorality. It doesn't say wrestle with it. It says run away from it. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Up here on the board, that word flee is from fuego in the Greek, to escape, to flee, to run away. Same Greek word in, used in 2 Timothy 2.22, two we just saw, flee from youthful lusts. Only here Paul uses a different word, immorality, up here on the board, from porneia. If you know anything about Greek derivatives, you know that porneia is the original Greek root for porn or pornography which is not just video, but also reading. Anything of this sort of immorality. And the interesting thing is that that Greek word is derived from pranao, which means to sell off. In other words, just think about that. You're born with a certain virtue, and you sell it off. For what? A lust? You're born with a certain virtue, and you sell it off. Properly, a selling off, surrendering of sexual purity, promiscuity of any, every type. Where we get the English porno, which is the root, obviously, for pornography. And we had this question. We, we looked at this a little bit longer on Thursday. Again, just a basic question. Does watching or reading pornography bring glory to God? I mean, it's a dumb question, but think about it. It's a fair one based on what people think on the lines of sexual sins nowadays. Seriously, it, there's, not a, there's not a huge chasm between what we would call pornography proper and what's walking around the streets and the types of interactions that are going on in high schools even, or in malls, or just, how about the beach? A hundred years ago, I'm serious, men and women would be arrested and thrown in jail for some of the stuff they wear on beaches. But our society is really, truthfully told, be told, is just degraded into awfulness. Verse 18, flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body, and that's a shame. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Yeah, glorify God in your body. Letting some man or woman touch your body in such a way that it ignites sexual sins is not glorifying God in your body. Jesus had a little something to say about sexual sin. Go to Matthew 5.27. Matthew 5.27. Jesus had something to say about this. And I love it because he's really not that, um, he's much less kind than I am even, if you think I'm unkind. Matthew 5.27 now he uses adultery, a specific sin, but it's still a sexual sin. 
Matthew 5, 27, You have heard that it is said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So, let's look at how strongly Jesus spoke about this kind of sin. Look at verse 29. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Up here on the board, what is he saying? Up here on the board, what you see and touch. Anything. Do you get it? anything. What did he say about, the, about adultery? If you look at another woman with a lust, you just committed adultery. So it's not even just about touching. He said, look, in Matthew 5, 27 and 30, Jesus addresses sins of the eye, verse 29, and sins of the hand, verse 30, both of which are evil and evidence for judgment. This disproves the thought that only physical sexual activity is sin. Now, this opens up a whole new can of worms, doesn't it? Because there's a lot of people in this world, a lot of Americans that say, well, as long as we don't have sex, because the Bible says don't have sex. Let me tell you, my friends, the Bible says a heck of a lot more than just don't have sex. Do you see it yet? It says a heck of a lot more than just, well, we didn't have sex. Well, why don't you and Bill Clinton get together? And you can talk about definitions about sexual activity. Do you get what I'm getting at? Let's stop playing games. And, and furthermore, let's stop teaching our children at very young ages this lie about what the Bible says and doesn't say. I'm giving you the truth. You want to wrangle with truth? That's between you and the Lord. What Jesus was saying in this tremendously powerful passage is that is what some of you need to hear on full volume right now. And I'm not just talking about single people. Obviously, single people are in full view right now. I'm talking about all of you. Married people, even. How about pe married people with kids? How about you train up your kid instead of, instead of being a coward? Instead of being a little coward, why don't you train your kid up? Why don't you say, hey, you know what? There's a tremendous series going on at North Christian Church. Here's a link. Why don't you do that? So I'm not just talking to single people, although obviously single people are in full view. Anything that causes you to sin in either of these ways ought to be cut out of your life, whether it's something through the eye gate or something you're touching, whether it's visual or physical. Whatever that thing is, get rid of it. Jesus, or just because you don't or didn't have some form of physical intercourse, and you notice I said intercourse because sex is not limited to, do I have to say it? Complete nudity. Do I have to say I shouldn't have to? But that's not sexual intercourse. Think about intercourse. You stick your tongue in someone's mouth. That's intercourse. I hate to be gross, but that's intercourse. What do you think that is? If it's not, if it's not sexual, then why aren't you doing it to everybody at family gatherings? Oh, good to see you, Auntie. <laughs> what? No, seriously. I'm just saying. I may never be invited back. I'm just saying. Why do we, no, but why do we like write that off? Why is it like, oh no, that's not, that's not intercourse at all. That's not sexual at all. Of course it's sexual. Who are we kidding here? Of course it's sexual. So let's stop it. But even that's not the end of it. So just because you didn't have some form of physical intercourse doesn't mean you had a pure heart. Remember, up here on the board, 2 Timothy 2.22, Now flee from youthful lusts, 
and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Now, the interesting thing about a pure heart, you ready? This is important. Here's another one, because what, it's like everything I teach that's difficult from this pulpit. He says, don't leave any stone unturned. Don't let anybody get out on some weird loophole. So, the interesting thing about a pure heart is that it's a two-way street. Let me explain. Facts about a pure heart. It is defiled when lust gives birth to sin. That's James 1.15. It's a sin to fall prey to temptation. It's a sin to prey on others through temptation. That's the two-way street. It's a sin to fall prey. So in other words, if, guys, if some pretty little thing comes bebopping in front of you half naked and you have a mental attitude thought, you just sinned. But God says, uh-uh-uh, that's not the end of the line. So does the little uh, tart who's bouncing around over here. She has a responsibility in this as well because now she's tempting somebody into sin. Neither one of those things bring glory to God, amen? You see, it takes two to tango, doesn't it? But there's another problem in our world. For some reason, only the one who has that second bullet up there seems to get all the problems. In the meantime, people are walking around, men and women, completely improperly, unbecomingly. See how upset it makes people? There's a baby crying. So the, this last bullet, it's a sin to prey on others through temptation. It is. That last bullet goes out to those who make a habit of tempting others in their weaknesses. And then turn around and say, what a perv. In order to sidestep their own sinning. In other words, keep the focus on that. Don't focus on the fact that I'm a floozy or I'm looking to get attention by hanging out of my dress or my, if you even want to call it a dress and not a long shirt anymore. That's what they're wearing, by the way, nowadays. How do I know? Because I have to go to Sean's like banquets and the girls are wearing long shirts as dresses. Who's dressing these kids? Who's letting them out of the house? And what are all these hormonal boys thinking? And is she innocent? No way. So says Scripture. So stop pointing and playing blame games on everybody. Your Lord and Master has something to say to you about this. Go to 1 Corinthians excuse me, 13, 4. Because the Spirit of Christ inspired this Scripture. Holy Scripture that we're about to read, which means that the Spirit of the one who said, if you got a bad eye, throw it out. If you got a bad hand, throw it out. That Spirit, that same person inspired this. This is his mind after all. 1 Corinthians 13, 4, love is patient, love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Un up here on the board, I gave you unbecomingly. Strong's has it as to act improperly, unseemly, to behave unbecomingly, or even dishonorably. The Bible says, honor your, God, honor your body. It's a temple. If you dishonor it, you're acting unbecomingly. Perhaps to consider something unseemly. This includes not just unbecoming actions, but also unbecoming speech. Remember, this is how many sexual sins begin, through verbal communication, not just physical. That so-called innocuous or uh, innocent flirting that you do. Yeah, that's a problem. That's a problem. Do you understand? 
Because you're, the whole premise of flirting is what? Sexuality. Because if a, a straight guy flirts with another straight guy, there's going to be a problem. Why? Because it's against sexuality, you see. Oh, man. He's not letting you out on anything, is he? No. No. How do you think all that starts? Why do you think, and I don't know, I remember this, um, this was probably 10 years ago now, that, statistics, that statistic from uh, London uh, or England that said that one out of seven divorces in England cited Facebook. Now, if you know anything about Facebook, Facebook is a, um, a petri dish of sin. Instant messenger, private messages, old high school flames all of a sudden pop up out of the woodwork. I remember how sexy you were back then. Whoa. Whoa, haven't seen this person in a while. Person happens to be weak. Next thing you know, guess what? Sexual sins. Imagine that. And I think the statistic is up to about one in four regarding social media in general. Just remember that many sexual sins begin with and through verbal communication, not just physical. So, on the physical aspect of things, let's cover this then. Go to 1 Timothy 2.9. How about physical first? And then we'll do, we'll do verbal or non-physical. First Timothy two nine. Okay. First Timothy two nine. Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing. How? Modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments. And that's a whole collective, by the way. If you have braids in your hair, don't get all sweating over there. It means don't. You know, keep things within what we would call modest boundaries. You know, sort of medium grade, so to speak. Modestly and discreetly, up here on the board. Modestly means with humility. Avoiding the shame. That's right. The shame of attracting attention to oneself in a way that doesn't bring glory to God. In other words, even if you come prancing in the church and you're constantly having to one-up the rest of the ladies with all your beads and your makeup and your this kind of a thing, and you just want the attention drawn to you, there's a problem because God's not glorified by that. This is a holy chapel. We shouldn't be casting out nets, sexual temptations. Do you understand what I'm getting at? Modestly means with humility, avoiding the shame of attracting attention to oneself in a way that doesn't bring glory to God. Discreetly refers to self-control over sexual passions, not wishing to lead others into temptation even. That covers a lot of ground, doesn't it? Modestly and discreetly. Do you dress the same way out there that you do in church? If not, why? I'm serious. God's not interested in you just making a good show on Sundays. Oh, I can't wear my pumps and my slit-up skirt and my whatever the heck you're wearing, or men, whatever you're wearing, I don't know. I don't even know nowadays. Right? I mean, do you wear the same things out there as you do in here? If not, why not? That's a fair question. I'll leave it at that. Is it modest? Is it discreet? Sadly, I'd argue that most women, and even more sadly, young girls, have no idea what the Bible has to say about modesty and discretion. Again, look at verse 9. Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and or gold pearls or costly garments, in other words, don't put on this big show, but rather by means of good works. Oh, man, if I'm going to adorn myself with something, maybe it should be something good, like good works. 
I don't, we don't, I don't have this in my notes, but go to Proverbs uh, 31. No, 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 no. You didn't let me finish. <laughs> Jeez, it's pretty cool to see, though. I wasn't even done. It was like, whoosh. Go read Proverbs 31 today at home, starting with chat, uh, verse 10. That's the virtuous woman, right? Go read that at home tonight, and you'll have a better idea of what God glorifies in women. I'll be teaching that in India. The virtuous woman will be based on much on that scripture. So anyways, but rather by means of good works, as is proper for women, making a claim to godliness. If, you put, if, some, if, if, if someone put half the energy they put into their looks, in their shopping, in their makeup and everything else, into God and actually good works, we'd be getting somewhere. And as we just noted with Jesus' own words in Matthew 5, 27 to 30, sexual sins aren't isolated to physical sins only. Okay, go to Ephesians 5, 3. Ephesians 5, 3. Ephesians 5, verse 3. So, sexual sins aren't isolated to just physical sins only. Ephesians 5, 3. But immorality, there's that word again, or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness in silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. In other words, what comes out of your mouth matters. I mean, how many, let's face it. How many jokes, I, I would love to know the percentage of jokes, adult jokes, that are not sexual. I'm serious. I'm talking about well-formed ones, and I'm talking about conversational even. Most talk nowadays, most giggles nowadays in most public gatherings have some sexual innuendo to it. That doesn't bring glory to God. So stop it. There you go. Some of you are like, man, i got to throw out my whole repertoire. <laughs> I'm serious. So be it. Then throw it out and shut your mouth. Maybe you shouldn't be talking so much. You ever think of that? I'm serious. If that's all you got, if that's your material, maybe you should talk less. <laughs> You're laughing, but isn't that true? I'm being, I'm being totally serious. Not disjoint from the word of God at all. I mean, there must be no filthiness. Is there any questions there? I mean, it says no filthiness and silly talk. Of course, jesting, which are not fitting. Okay. As we noted on Thursday, the practical ramifications of this, especially if one desires to please God, and as Paul wrote, be a, quote, vessel of honor, sanctified, useful to the master, that's 2 Timothy 2.21, then they must choose their lifestyles. That's right. They must choose their lifestyles very carefully, beginning with the company they keep. Go to 1 Corinthians 15.33. 1 Corinthians 15.33. Choose your company wisely. It's incredible. I mean... And, and, it's, and it's like, you know, coarse jesting and that kind of stuff, that kind of filthy talk, it's like a brush fire, isn't it? Because someone throws the match, right? And then the whole group just degrades into ungodliness. Right? There's a big bonfire within like three seconds because everybody's chirping in with their little, you know, their material. And the whole thing just goes up in flames. And who knows, maybe there's a new person there, or maybe there's a young person there, maybe there's an impressionable young believer there, and they're saying to themselves, this is what it means to represent Christ? This kind of talk? Everything seems to be sexual around here. Huh. Verse 33 of 1 Corinthians 15, Do not be deceived, bad company corrupts good morals. Up here on the board. From ethos, morals, means habit, manner, custom, morals, where we get the English ethics in context refers to that which friendship with the world corrupts. Consider our society's viewpoint on sexual sins. 
and let's, let's not just point fingers because there are a lot of Christians, probably everyone listening to my voice right now, that does a whole lot of coarse jesting. And you laugh because you have burn marks all over your arms from those bonfires that you helped light. Why is it so quiet in there? Everybody's like, man, there's like no room to be anything but holy. Isn't that sanctification? Isn't that the objective? Last time I checked, unless you've got a different Bible, I mean, I'm open, but... Proverbs 1.10, My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. So the next time coarse jesting comes up, don't participate. Stop encouraging the idiot. Do you understand what I'm saying? Let them figure out on their own that it's not appropriate, it's not even funny, it's disgusting. Let them figure it out on their own when you don't laugh, when you don't encourage them and, and throw hay and wood on the fire and then gasoline. I'm serious. This is what the Bible says. How about 2 Peter 2, 18 and 19? For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error, promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. For by what a man is overcome by this, he is enslaved. I'd argue that to some degree. Everyone here, including myself, of course, at some point in our lives, whether young or old, have been a slave to sexual sins. And don't say, oh, not me, and I'm not looking at anybody. And some of you old people are like, hey, how does he know this about us? He wasn't even born. <laughs> you know how I know? Because the Bible says you're sick. There's a reason why there's so much scripture on sexual sins and immorality and impurity and all these kinds of things. Why do you think that is? Because the creator himself inspired this book and said, I know your weaknesses. And there's certain ones you, you listen up, you got to run from because you won't conquer them. You got to run. Run, Forrest. Run. Right? Till the braces blow off. Run away, because you will be overcome. So I would argue that everyone in here, to some degree, at some point in their life, has been a slave to these kinds of sins. Again, why do you think there's so much written about it in the Bible, Old Testament and New? Go to 1 Thessalonians 4.3. 1 Thessalonians 4.3. Thessalonians 4.3. <clears throat> when you have a mountain of evidence like this in the Bible... It is utterly undeniable that you are an arrogant whatever you want to call yourself if you deny such things. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 For this is the will of God, your sanctification. Haven't I been saying that for the whole of this class? This is the will of God that you're sanctified. That is that you abstain from, there it is again, sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not even know God. Do you see what he just said there? Let me read it again. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is that you abstain from, from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion, like the Gentiles who do not know God. So, here's the big question. What's all this got to do with American dating? Maybe some of you listening to my voice are still trying to justify the American version of dating as somehow righteous or at least not unrighteous. I gave you the example of a jar full of marbles, right? The Bible says, do this, that's a red marble. The Bible says, don't do that, that's a blue marble. You put all those in, and you get all these crevices in between. And because there's all these, this dark space in between, you can do whatever you want. No, sorry, it doesn't work like that. That's you trying to justify something ungodly in your life. That's you trying to stand with your ridiculous lifestyle, the one that brings no honor to God. 
in that way at least. So maybe some of you are listening to my voice are still trying to justify the American version of dating as righteous or at least as not unrighteous. Looking for little crevices and loopholes. So how can it be, I ask, when we have clearly stated Holy Scripture such as, go to 1 Corinthians 7, 1. 1 Corinthians 7, 1. How about, how can it possibly be when we have holy? You notice I keep using the word holy? I'm doing that on purpose. How can it be when we have clearly stated holy scripture, such as, for example, 1 Corinthians 7, 1. What's wrong with American dating? I'm going to tell you what's wrong with American dating. For one reason. Amongst the others obvious that have been so obvious already. Verse 1, now concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, again, that doesn't mean I, you know, I don't go up to someone and put my arm around them and say, love you or something like that, you know. But we're talking about something else, and this is where going to the original language helps. It's from the Greek word hapto. It is good for a man not to do this, not to touch a woman, right? From hapto means to fasten, to lay hold of, cling to, to ignite, to modify or change by touching. Properly, touching that influences, modifies. Touching someone or something in a way that alters, changes, modifies them. In brief, impact touching. Impact touching. There's a whole lot of that that goes on in American-style dating. There's a whole lot of mugging up and touching and squeezing and all that kind of stuff that's completely improper. Why? Because it ignites sin. Do you see it? A man should not touch a woman when it ignites something in either of them. So what Paul wrote was simple. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. In context, as we'll see here, Paul is talking about a woman, by the way, who is not your wife. Again, repeat. A woman who is not your wife. So don't get confused and think Paul is like some weirdo that's saying all men should never touch women. No, he said if you're not married, then you shouldn't be touching a woman in such a way where there's an ignition, especially in the sexual realm, whether it's thought or physical. In other words, what we know is American dating where teens and adults alike are clinging to each other, igniting sexual thoughts and often actions. You might, not to be gross, but even that little game of teasing that you do, that's not good either. But we'll leave that to your own discovery. Igniting sexual thoughts and, and often actions are inappropriate as far as Holy Scripture is concerned, and therefore it's a sin. In fact, the Bible calls such touching immoral. Immoral, which means that when we see the word immoral, immoralities, etc., in the word, it includes this kind of touching. Again, this is one real tangible way to distinguish between biblical courting and American dating. Because I don't want you to be confused either and say, well, then how the heck? Say, I do want a husband or a wife. Well, how do I do it? Then do it without doing all this stuff. You certainly don't need to touch each other and ignite certain sexual passions in each other because that's not going to go anywhere good. As soon, as soon as that happens, where does your mind go? On Christ? I don't think so. Your mind goes somewhere else, and it has nothing to do with Christ. And everything to do with that ten steps out? So says the horny little teenager. Hey, you know, if I just stay on this vector, eventually I can bed this girl. What do you think he's thinking? Can we stop playing games? That's the flesh. Do you think the flesh is somehow pseudo-pure? It's not. The flesh is an animal. You might have a little patience. 
But nonetheless, its end goal is what, exactly what all of you are thinking it is. So the Bible calls touching this way immoral. So when we see any derivative of that word, it includes this kind of touching. Again, this is one real tangible way to distinguish between biblical courting and American dating. You want to court somebody? Go spend time with them, not alone. Or bring a friend along, or a parent along, or something like that. Or make sure that you're not going to be caught in a situation where all of a sudden, you know, there's like, <laughs> let me roll down that window. Remember in like the old movies, right? <laughs> Richie from uh, Happy Days or whatever, you know? Next thing you know, he's, you know, he's like on her neck. Yeah, that's touching. Because you don't do that to Aunt Mildred, I hope. Do you follow what I'm getting at? Can we just stop playing pretend? So biblical courting would be, yeah, maybe we go to a fair together. Maybe we go to a movie together, but we're not going to be hanging on each other. We're certainly not going to be making out. And if, if, you, if you can't do that thing because you know that you don't have the willpower, then take someone along with you and have a good time. And find out, you ready for this? You ready for this one? Are you guys ready for this one? See if they even know Christ. How about that? What are you doing with a schlep that really could care less about Jesus Christ? I'm serious. What are we doing? And why would you want to let that, let that thing touch you anyways? Knowing that it's that, that person's flesh that's trying to defile you. Why would you want to do that anyways? Why would you want that in your life anyways? Where is that going that's good? How is that bringing glory to God? You tell me. How can you justify that as a lifestyle, given what we've read already? Biblical courting? Fine. Find out who God chose for you, because he will walk somebody in the door, and you'll know who it is. Again, that's one way up here on the board... Some of you are asking, well, geez, you're taking out all my, you know, my arsenal. How am I supposed to get a wife or a husband, right? I can't prance around in my mini skirts. How am I going to attract 15,000 guys and then choose from one of them after I've slept with half of them? Oh, 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 he had to go there. He just had to go there. I'm such an evil character, ain't I? Not many wise. Not many noble. I told you that, right? Now, this, I, I hate to get gross, but since you're laughing, this is a true, this is a true honest to good conversation I had with a young lady, a Christian young lady who was in her, I don't know, mid-20s. This was a while ago. Well, not that long ago. Mid-20s, I'd say. And she said it's not unlikely nowadays for a woman, by the time she's 30, to have... 30 sexual partners. And I said, you're kidding me, right? Nope. What? What the heck is left other than a big piece of scar tissue? What's left for the husband, if there ever is one? How does that, honest to God, 30 partners? And I'm not judging anybody. Do you understand what I'm saying? That is actually being um, promoted in our society. That's why that's there. I'm not judging anybody if you've had 30 or 40 or 50 or 60. I don't know. That's your business. I'm just saying, that. how did that become like normal? And how is nobody up in arms about it? That's my question. Given what? And I'm talking about, I'm talking to believers now, or so-called Christians. How is that acceptable in our own circle? How, do we lo how are we loving these young ladies or men by not telling them to flee? How's that love if we're a parent and we're not telling our beautiful, virtuous young daughters before they get tripped up, flee from that? How are we not telling our young men to do the same? Where are our parenting skills? Why are we not teaching this? Do you understand what I'm saying? Aren't we Christians? Don't we represent Christ? Well, this is his mind. Why are we not teaching kids this? Why are we just saying, oh, whatever, it's, you know, it's, over. it's in the dark, so nobody cares. It shouldn't matter, right? It's in the dark. Why are we not doing? Why are we not standing up for it? Well, we are now. 
least I am, and I'm hoping you're coming along. Quoting verses dating, to remain righteous, there should be no, say it with me, what? No touching that ignites immorality, be it mindful or physical. Such touching is designed as a part of the exclusive domain of marriage. Okay, verse 1, you ready? Now concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. But because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife, and each woman is to have her own husband. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Stop depriving one another, except by agreement for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. And come together again, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But this I say by way of concession, not command. Yet I wish that all men were even as myself, uh, as I myself am. He was single, remember. This is Paul. However, each man has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows that it is good for them if they remain even as I. But if they do not have self-control, in other words, you can't stop touching or thinking or whatever that's going on in your head with another person, then let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. In other words, if you can't not touch each other, then get married and have at it. I would say there's more consideration. Just remember the context here. Paul's speaking very narrowly about this idea. So I'm just saying, hey, listen, if you see somebody and you can't, you guys don't have any self-control, run off to Vegas and get married so that you don't have, come on, can we not do that either? Because that's going to be problematic, I'm just saying. So just make sure you're in the context. Again, if you, cannot, if you can't not touch each other, then get married and have at it. However, now if this person's not married, if this, you say to yourself, oh my God, I could never marry him. I could never marry her. Then what are you doing with him? Then what are you doing with him then? Seriously, you selfish ass. What are you doing with them then? You're basically satisfying your own selfish lust. Can I get an amen? That's exactly what it is. So stop trying to pretend. But I'm trying to evangelize them because they're not saved. Close your legs. Let's start and open the Bible. How about that? Open the Bible. I sound like a real Bible thumper from the 1800s, don't I? <laughs> Seriously, right? What are we doing? Close your mouth. Close, every, close up shop. How about that? This shop not open for touchy touchy. Right? Closed for business. I'm serious. What are we teaching our kids? You know what we're teaching them? You ready? We're teaching them a counterfeit marriage. We're teaching them a counterfeit marriage. Here it is. Satan's counterfeit marriage. We might consider American dating as Satan's counterfeit to godly marriage. Because it satisfies the lusts of the flesh while disregarding the sovereign's design will for marriage and family. He says, in other words, you can have all the goodies that come along with marriage, but you don't actually have to be married. That's what Satan's counterfeit marriage looks like. Do you understand? Do you not see it in this world? It's everywhere. People are like, yeah, but you know, it's good because divorces are on the, on the degrade. No, that's only because people don't get married anymore. They just bounce around like, the, like I said, the long, young lady said, with 30 partners until I guess eventually they just get weary and say, well, I don't have any more options. I guess I'll take you. You know what I'm getting at? This whole thing has been counterfeited. It, just think very pure thoughts right now. And say to yourself, and imagine even God's design, sex was only supposed to be between a husband and a wife. Anything that goes along with that was only supposed to be between a husband and a wife. Anything outside of that is ungodly. Any thought, action, deed, 
anything outside of that is beyond God's will for men and women. Do you see how simple it is? No, just think about that. Think about how simple that is. And then think about our society. It's chaos. It's absolute emotional, horrible, horrific tragedy. It's, if, if, if emotions were airplanes, that's all we'd do. We'd just be looking outside right now going, right? That's all it'd be, fireballs everybody, everywhere. That's, that, that's what we live with. And nobody's saying anything. Nobody's saying, don't get in the airplane. Don't take off. Satan's counterfeit marriage. We might consider American dating as Satan's counterfeit to godly marriage. Why? Because it satisfies the lust of the flesh while disregarding the sovereign's divine will for marriage and family. Amen? All right, let's show the video. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you so much for always being faithful to us, to appealing to our consciences, our good consciences, Father, for giving your spirit the time and the space the authority to convict us of the things that matter most in this world that keep us on that narrow road, Father. Thank you for never pulling punches with us. Thank you for never giving us space for excuse to survive for too long. And thank you for giving us the time to turn around that next corner to see the appropriate adjustments carried out in our lives. Thank you for giving us the strength and the power to do it in the face of so much opposition in our families, our friends, our co-workers, whatever the case may be. Thank you most of all for your grace and of course your undying love. For despite all of these warts and scars and self-mutilizations, you loved us and you saved us. We ask for traveling mercies as we take these things out to a lost and dying world, Father, that needs it so desperately. We ask these things in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. Amen.